Let's call upon our awesome king. Blessed are the people who know the sound of the shofar. In the light of your countenance, so Yahweh shall they walk. Baruch atad and Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam, Asher Kitshiyanu B'Misotovitz Ivanu, Lishmoach Shofar. Blessed are you, O Yahweh Elohim, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by your commandments and has commanded us to hear the voice of the shofar. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Baruch Shem Kevod, Malhuto Leolam Vayed. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our El, Yahweh is one. Blessed be his name and his glorious kingdom forever. And Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am Yahweh that does sanctify you. Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations, for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days Yahweh made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Ve'ahavta et Yahweh Elochecha bechol lavcha uvechol nafshicha uvechol meodecha ve'hayu hadvarim ha'ele ashir anochi mitzvchayoma levavecha ve'shinan tam levenecha ve'dibarta bam be'shivtecha bevetecha uvlechtecha v'derek uv'shach bicha uv'komecha uksharta am le. You shall love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. All right. Let's extend your hands toward the children, and Isaac's going to lead us this morning, and Scarlett's going to kind of coach him with that. Abba. Open my it. eyes to receive and your truth. To go and and say amen. 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 <laughs> and say by his grace, not one will be lost. Amen. May we protect and defend you. May he always shield. Israel a shining day. May you be like Ruth and Ephraim. May you be deserving of praise. Strengthen them, O Yah, and keep them from the strangers. and defend you. May Yahweh preserve you His way. Favor them, O Yah, with happiness and peace. O 
hear our Sabbath prayer. I was glad when they said to me, Come to the house of the Lord Standing here in your gates again Come to Jerusalem oh, I was glad when they said to me Come to the house of the Lord Standing here in your gates again Unto Jerusalem, unto Jerusalem, unto Jerusalem Jerusalem, peace, Adonai, Sasha, Lord Blessing be yours, God's peace within your heart I was glad when they said to me, come to the house of the Lord You shall say before Yahweh your Elohim, I have removed the sacred portion from my house and also have given it to the Levite and the alien, the orphan and the widow, according to all your commandments which you have commanded me. I have not transgressed or forgotten any of your commandments. I have not eaten of it while mourning, nor offered any of it to the dead. I have listened to the voice of Yahweh my Elohim. I have done according to all that you have commanded me. Look down from your holy habitation from heaven and bless your people Israel and the ground which you have given us, a land flowing with milk and honey, as you swore to our fathers. Amen. Amen. Baruch Atah Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Bachar Banim Rikul HaAmin, Benetan Lanu Et Torato, Baruch Atah Adonai, Noten HaTorah, 
Amen. Bless Yahweh the Blessed One. Blessed is Yahweh the Blessed One for all eternity. Blessed are you, O Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who has chosen us from all peoples and given us his Torah. Blessed are you, O Yah, giver of the Torah. Amen. Y'all may be seated. So anyway, I'm having my lovely wife. She's going to help me today. And uh, she did a PowerPoint on this subject. And this is about Yom Kippur. This is going to be about, you know, the fasting and why we fast and humbling ourselves, and, and really how all of that ties together. There's always, um, as we're learning how to do his feast and festivals, and it is important that we do exactly what he asked us to do. And because just like we was, you know, singing in that song, there's, he has a reason for everything that he does. And a lot of times he puts things in our past for us to do because of rebellion. Like where in the zitzits, where in the zitzits stem from because they were rebellious. And he said, this is what you're going to do to remind you to remind, and that word is plural, so it was supposed to be for the community to wear them so that they would be reminded of the commandments. And that's what he said. Whether people do it or not, that's on you. You're going to answer for that one day. You know, and that's just, they're just not threads. But now, if you're going to put the zit zit on and you're not going to do what the commandments say to do, then they become threads. So there's a reason why. And so on the Day of Atonement, um, there's always been this issue, do we fast, do we not, what does it mean, and all of the above. So we're going to teach on that today because Yom Kippur is coming up. <clears throat> Guys, we know and we understand that when he taught about Passover, he taught about Passover, and I just want to liken this. For many years, they took a lamb, and they, they went up to whenever the tabernacle was in uh, Shiloh and remember the tabernacle. I think that's where it was at for all of those years, three almost four hundred years. And they went there and they sacrificed that lamb. They sacrificed that lamb with the tendency of looking for the lamb to come. They wasn't just just doing it because okay, this is the time to have a meal. They brought that with their heart of knowing that one day Yeshua was going to send the Lamb of Elohim, the Lamb of God. He was going to send that. But then what happened is, is they got so used to just doing it, and it became rote, they forgot to look for the Lamb to come. And then when He came in their midst, in one moment, they were saying, Hallelujah, you know, and then four days later, they're saying, Crucify Him. And so it shows them that their heart wasn't trained to know what the times and seasons and to see exactly when it unfolds in our life. This is why this is important. Because guess what? This day, the Day of Atonement, whenever trumpets happens, guys, the Day of Atonement is Judgment Day. There's no more, can I get myself ready? You're now standing before your Maker. And if Yeshua is not, the blood of Yeshua, if Yeshua is not standing beside you as an advocate, your lawyer, and you're standing there by yourself, you're in trouble. Because then after that time is over, it talks about the closing of the gates. The um, Scriptures tells us many times, and even in Matthew, about whenever it's over with, that gate and that door is shut. And there's a lot of beating and banging on that door. And He says, Depart from Me, you workers of lawlessness. In other words, those who didn't follow the commandments, those who didn't follow my ways. I've given you my ways. This is what you do. You didn't do it. Now the door's shut. Where have we seen this shutting of the door before? All the way back during the time of Noah. He gave them time. He ministered to them for years. And then all of a sudden, He said, load up. And when they, they loaded up, the animal showed up. Then He told the guys, uh, Noah, you and your family, you load up. The door stayed open for seven more days. And then Yahweh shut the door at His time. And I'm telling you, at the moment when that door hit, rain started falling. And that's what happens. Everything happens that quick. 
So this is what this is about. And so taking Yom Kippur seriously is about life and death of being in the kingdom and being cut off. And so this is why this is very, very, very important. So with that, it says, where do we get afflicting or humbling our souls is fasting. So I'm going to have Tammy uh, help me with this today because she's going to do some reading. So it's at least three times in the scripture that we're told to afflict or humble our souls on Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. And the first place would be Leviticus 16, 29 through 31. All right, let me read this one. Okay. And then I'm going to let you read the next two. Okay. This shall be a permanent. Does anybody know what permanent means? Forever. Permanent statute for you. In the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, and it says something. You shall humble your souls. Now, I just want to say this. When you're fasting or when you're humbling your souls, you're affecting your spirit, soul, and body. You're affecting everything about you. So it says, you're to humble your souls and do not do any work, whether the native or the alien. So who in the land was supposed to not do any work? No one. No one. It was supposed to shut down on that day. Who sojourns among you, it is to be a Sabbath, a Shabbat, a Shabbaton of solemn rest for you, and you may humble your souls. It is a permanent statue. Now, it's sort of Im impressive that he's not, he's shutting everybody down in the land. He's shutting everybody down on this day. This is how important this day is, and this is how important it is for us to humble our souls on this day. And you have a double it that it's a permanent statue. He That's begins right. and ends that passage there with a double it. Then we have Leviticus 23, 27, and 29. On exactly the 10th day of this seventh month is the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you, and you shall humble your souls and presenting, present an offering by fire to Yahweh. If there is any person who will not humble himself on this same day, he shall be cut off from his people. So you can see what I just said there before. The word... He shall be cut off among his people. This is what happens. Remember the ten virgins? Five were wise, five were foolish. Five didn't have enough oil. What happened? That's a picture. They were cut off from among their people. They were cut off from Yahweh. And this is the language that's talking about even in that parable. Then we have another verse in Numbers 29.7. It says, then on the 10th day of this seventh month, you shall have a holy convocation and you shall humble yourselves. You shall not do any work. So he's repeated this three times just in the first five books of Torah to the children of Israel. I mean, if we didn't get it time one, we're going to get second time and we get a third. Every word that is to be established has how many witnesses? Two or three witnesses, exactly. Amen. So we have here... We have the word in Strong's, nephesh, the word soul. This is one thing that you've heard, you've been here, you know, you're not strange, you know, to this word. Some that may be visiting may be strange to this word. Nephesh is where we get our word when we talk about soul. But not only do we talk about soul, it says self, life, creature, person. What is the one in red? Appetite. Appetite. Mind, living being, desire, emotions, and passions. This is nephesh, and this is our soul, and our soul encompasses all of these varieties of, of feelings and emotions and passions. And guys, we understand the word appetite. And the, ap the word appetite affects us not only when we're hungry physically, but also what our desires are in, in spiritually and all of these other things is cravings that we have. So we're going to hopefully by the end, you're going to see how all of this ties in, especially when we get to the place of appetite. So if Tammy, if you would read Psalm 35, 13. 
But these are scriptures that will define and show patterns for humbling or afflicting the soul as connected to the appetite. And the reason we want to show you the biblical use of the phrase humble your souls is because there are teachings out there that are saying that you can decide for yourself what afflicts your soul. Well, I don't know how many of you, but I know for me, if it starts inflicting a little too much pain, I'm probably going to back off. I love to know that there is a biblical usage of this word that lets me know exactly what does the Father expect, and then I know the grace is given to me to follow through with that. So uh, one of the verses is Psalm 35, 13, but as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth, I humbled my soul with fasting, and my prayer kept returning to my bosom. Do you want me to read Ezra as well? Ezra 8, 21. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava that we might humble ourselves before our Elohim to seek from him a safe journey for us, our little ones, and our possessions. Psalm 69, 10. When I wept and chastened my soul, that word is also afflicted my soul, with fasting that was to my reproach. And in Psalm 69, 10, because I have the ESV, the word chastening is the word humbled. So what we're doing is, is we're giving you plenty of scriptures of talking about now fasting, um, humbling your soul, uh, chastening, chastening, and all of these, these words that relates back to our appetite. All right, I'm going to let you, if you would read. I'm going to let you read the scripture. Read verse 3, and then I'm going to read the IVP portion of this. Okay, that's going to be Isaiah 58, a very, very common chapter for a lot of us. And I'll start with verse 3. Why have we fasted and you do not see? Why have we humbled ourselves and you do not notice? Behold, on the day of your fast, you find your desire and drive hard all your workers. So you see here that what they wasn't doing during this period of time, and during this period of time in Isaiah, was, is talking about when they're back rebuilding the walls and rebuilding the this temple. That's right. This is Yom Kippur. The IBP says this in this commentary, fasting. Fasting is a little attested in the ancient Near East outside the, the Bible. It generally occurs in the context of mourning. In the Old Testament, the religious use of fasting is often connection with making a request before Elohim. Now, not only are we making a request before Elohim, He's making an appointment for us to make a request to Him. He's inviting us because this is an appointed time. This is not, there's all, you can fast and you can pray and you, we need to. Whenever there's an issue, do we need to buy this house? Do we need this? Or do we need this job? Whatever. We do need to fast and pray about it. But when the Father's asking us to show up with fasting and prayer, as a community, as a community or as a nation, we really need to hear or take heed to it. Then it says this, the principle that the importance of the request causes an individual to be so concerned about his or her spiritual condition that the physical necessities fade into the background. This is what fastening is about. It's about bringing our spiritual life to the forefront. All of our nephesh and carnality needs to go to the background. It says, in this sense, the act of fasting is designed as a process leading to purification and humbling oneself before Elohim says this, it is not an end in itself, but rather it is the discipline training in preparation for an important event. And this is what's so excited about this. This is why fasting, look, if you don't do it for the right reason, you're just going to be hungry that day. But if you're doing it for the right reason, it's for purification this is a time to where we're coming before Him because, guys, we're going to stand before Him and we're going we're gonna to have to answer for everything that's not been repented of. 
And so you can see why we're during this month of Elul, we've had 40, I mean, we're going to have 30 days and then we're going to have trumpets in the 10 days of all. You can see how much he loves us to where he can have a trumpet blast. He can have a trumpet blast to gather, but yet he leaves that door open 10 more days until this day before he shuts that door and he shuts it off and says, it's over. And this is why I say this is one of the most important teachings that we're going to hear because this is reality. And where have we seen this before? We saw it at the first, when Yeshua came the first time. They killed him. But guys, he's not coming as a suffering lamb the second time. He's coming as a conquering king. So we don't have any say-so. The judgment's already been done. Now it's our turn to be judged. He took judgment for us. He took sin from it. He took all of that. He gave us His righteousness. But if we're not walking in that, then we're going to be held accountable for that on this day. So this is why fasting is so important. It's not just though so you just roll into this day like it's another old day. This is a time to where we need to be very serious. That's why during the month of Elul that we need to be serious. It's prepara preparation. It's, it's disciplining ourselves. This is what these times and seasons. Guys, this is a discipline that we're to do it because I don't know when that trumpet sound. We talked about this, you know, a couple of weeks ago. I want to know that whenever that trumpet sounds, I hear that sound. I don't hear noise. Because you're going to hear one or the other. Some's going to think it thundered. And they're going to say, what was that? And then all of a sudden, whenever he is gathering his people, where he's gathering his people, then, then I don't, look, he's still going to have them 10 awesome days. But these, these days of all, they're not awesome like, man, there's a party awesome. These, it is going to be now... It is going to be, if you can make it to Yom Kippur, if you can make it there, you're going to have to press. You're going to have to press and repent and pray. You're going to have to press to get to that place. That's what days of all means. The thing is, is why not let's just do it right now and let's be in a place to where, because really and truly, fasting and, and celebrating His times, it's a joy. For us to do this because he's already paid the price. He is our high priest. Who was the one that was to take the offering once a year behind the veil? The high priest and Yeshua is that high priest. He now does this on the what? Day of atonement. This is a time to where he was atoning for the high priest was atoning for the sins of the nations. And we've already read here to where the whole land was to shut down on this day. So I'm just trying to convey over and over again that I don't want us to get laxed about this day and just say, well, this is a day I can just sit back. I'm going to sleep later this day. You know, I'm going to try to, you know, conserve every bit, you know. I will tell you this, prepare for a fast because if you don't, it's miserable. You have headaches. Some people throw up. Might have did it. But, you know, I'm just saying, but hydrate, you can do these things. But if we're preparing now, it can be a joyous time to where we can celebrate our King. Amen. And we did mention this on a little, but I think it bears repeating that, you know, the scripture says, as you'll know the end from the beginning. So how we start the feast cycle, we have our pattern in the Exodus. When Yahweh came to Moses and Aaron, I just want to repeat this because it's going to fit with the 10th day. He told Moses and Aaron, he said, what? This is the beginning of months for you. And on the 10th of this month, you are to select a lamb. So, if we can put ourselves in their shoes and we can say, okay, I've just got a word from Yahweh and in 10 days, I've got to select a lamb and then I'm going to examine it for four days. Do you guys think for those 10 days, they were just life as usual or, or were they thinking, what flock do I get this lamb from? I mean, he's told us to select a lamb. Okay, we've got to start right now preparing where, what lambs am I going to take it from? And then we've got, by the 10th of this month, we've got to select that lamb. And then we examine it for four days. And then he's, he's sacrificed exactly at twilight on the 14th of Nisan. And then as we know, the greater exodus, I mean, the exodus happened on the 15th. You fast forward to the end of Yahweh's feast cycle, you have Yom Teruah. 
You had the announcement, right? You're always announcing the king is coming, Yeshua is coming. And 10 days later, you have Yom Kippur. And you have who? Yeshua, who that lamb that was selected back in Exodus is representing. Yeshua is making the final atonement for his people to bring them back to his father that has been going on since the day of the fall when he's been making restitution and redemption for his people. So it is no coincidence that it was 10 days to prepare for that 10th day selection, and we have 10 days to prepare for the judgment day, Yom Kippur. And then what? Five more days they exodus, five more days we enter. Amen. So it's a, it's a beautiful picture. So let me just say this. You tell me if I'm wrong, and you can. We will. I know. No, just kidding. <laughs> Think about this. How many times we know that we are supposed to do something or be somewhere or especially do something, and we, ha we hear this, well, I just didn't have time. He'll say, well, did you get this done? I just didn't have time. Has we ever said that? Husbands, wives, amen. Y'all can raise your hand. I'm good with that. Because I guess what? Just like what she said, you were to select the lamb on the 10th day. Is it acceptable to come and say, I just didn't have time? No, because you had a year. You have a year to know that you got this preparation after the last one, after the last pace off. You got a year to know, guys, this is the way we are. We're so busy with our stuff. We're so busy with us. A lot of times we roll into what the Father wants done, and we always say, I didn't have time. That ain't the right one to say, I don't have time to. It's one thing saying it to your wife and hoping she's got grace and leaves the frying pan in the, in the pantry. But my thing is, is you, but to, to do it with him, and when he says, you've got my word, because he doesn't come out and remind you all the time, he sends his shepherds to do that. And I'm reminding, and we've been reminding, but sometimes we still slide in and say, man, here I am the day before, and I'm rushing to get things done. That's the wrong attitude. And this is something that, because this is about training to know how important he gave up his son's life for me, and then I'm going to tell him I just didn't have time. That's the wrong answer. Because I will be standing on the other side of that door, not on the right side. Amen. Verse 5 of Isaiah 58 says, Is it a fast like this which I choose, a day for a man to humble himself? Is it for bowing one's head like a reed and for spreading out sackcloth and ashes as a bed? Will you call this a fast, even an acceptable day to Yahweh? And if you give yourself to the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then your light will rise in darkness and your gloom will become like midday. So this is two ways of saying the same thing, right? Will you give yourself to the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted? That's saying the same thing two different ways. And if you will give yourself to the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, or so let's go to... You want to go to the Brit? Acts, yeah, we'll go to Acts 27. Okay. okay. Acts 27. Is this sort of after the resurrection of Yeshua? So we can see that they were still, the temple's still standing here. But even when the temple wasn't standing, you still saw them celebrating the feast. All right, but in this verse here in verse 9, it says, When considerable time had passed... And the voyage was now dangerous, since even the fast was already over. What fast do you think that they were talking about? That's right, Yom Kippur. Paul began to admonish them. I want to read a little bit in the IVP commentary on verse 9. The fast here refers to Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, which occurs in September or October, because we know how the feast days are. Sea travel became more dangerous as winter approached. 2 Timothy 4.21 and Titus 3.12. Shipping was completely closed down from around November the 10th 
to the, as late as March the 10th, but September the 15th to November the 10th and March 11th and May 26th were risky periods as well. So we know that whenever we've re read in the book of Acts, we've seen, was Paul sort of like shipwrecked one time? Why, did, why was he shipwrecked? He had warned them, you don't need to go. And they said, you're a prisoner, we're going. He said, okay. And they went, and what happened? They had, and this is this area, when you look on a map and you see the area that they were traveling, it was because of winter, it was rough, they had rocks, it, they had the reefs, they had all of this. It was very, very, very dangerous. So you can see here that in this scripture, it said that it had talked about how the voyage was now dangerous since the fast had already was over. So he's telling you, the Yom Kippur, he's telling you the season of what he's talking about right here. And so we just threw this verse in there to let you know that even during this time, the Father even puts these hints in Scripture to let us know that they were still celebrating the feast and the festivals. Amen? With fasting. Okay, so what we're going to do now, Tammy's going to read in uh, Genesis chapter 3, because she is way better reader than I am, because I'll do chloroform and chlorophyll and all of that and mess it all up. So what we want you to do but is... before you go there... Okay, I want them to... Pay attention to the red, is all I was going to say. Yeah, cool you jets. Okay, I just want you to notice in this right here, you're going to see the word eat or not to eat 14 times in these scriptures. Eat or not to eat is going to be mentioned 14 times in this scripture. Now, guys, this is important. I just want to set this up. We tithe, okay? When we done this thing on tithing, which I don't like talking about tithing because it talks about money and all of that, and I hate it. But I have to. But here's the deal. Remember in Malachi it says, how are we robbing you? He says, will you rob Elohim? And he says, well, how are we robbing you? He says, tithes and offerings. I went back and I made a step. I, I said, okay, where's the first robbery? The first robbery was in the garden when they took from the tree of knowledge of eat good and evil that didn't belong to them. So they robbed from him. So guess what? He gives me and you 100%. But he says 10 of that don't belong to you. It belongs to me. We also have responsibility not to take what belongs to the Father. So we don't get a pass just because we're not in the garden. No, we're going to do just like Adam and Eve. So he's going to give us a hundred. In other words, was the garden put in there with all the, I mean, was the tree put in the garden with all the rest of the trees? And did he have to tend that with all the rest? Yes, he did. He just couldn't eat it. He had to tend it, but he couldn't eat it. And then she got into this deception, well, we can't touch it. He never did say that. He said, don't eat of it. So what happens is, is this, to me, is the same principle about this eating, okay? So take off. All right. So now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which Yahweh Elohim had made. And he said to the woman, indeed, has Elohim said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, Elohim has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die for Elohim knows it in the day that you eat from it. Your eyes will be opened and you will be like Elohim, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate and she gave also to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed naked, naked. and they sewed fig <laughs> leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. They heard the sound of Yahweh Elohim walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Yahweh Elohim among the trees of the garden. Then Yahweh Elohim called to the man and said to him, Where are you? 
Now, did Yahweh know where he was? Absolutely. Is that a rhetorical question he's asking? Yeah. Absolutely. He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree, and I ate. That's what I'm talking about. You know, uh, remember, she's my helpmate, and the helpmate helped me eat that fruit. Mm -hmm. And y'all have been blaming us ever since, hadn't you? <laughs> what I'm talking about. Then Yahweh Elohim said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. Then to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. And the Hebrew word for toil is the word, it's saphon. And the biblical usage of this word is pain, labor, hardship, sorrow, and toil. Can you see the concepts of affliction, humbling yourself, sorrow, pain? So from the beginning, because they ate something they were not supposed to eat, then he, this is the curse that was put on them. So this is going to begin to tie things together. Okay. So before we go to the next, we can go to the next PowerPoint. So here is what we're understanding. Fasting, humbling yourself, afflicting your soul. All of this ties back to the very beginning. It ties back to the very beginning when they were disobedient to start with when they didn't heed exactly what Yahweh told them to do. We are to guard and keep what the Father has given us. We talked about last week, we talked about whenever we as a people, um, the children of Israel as a whole, we live within the boundaries that the Father gives us. We don't go outside those boundaries. Remember we talked about Esau and we talked about Moab and Ammon and you talked about these people. And the Father said, you're going to go up by them, but do not attack them because I will not give you into their hands. Because He gave them a portion. Whether we like it or not, whether they liked it or not, they had a boundary and they had a portion. And if you noticed it, it was where Lot was when you read the Scripture. The Father does things for us and brings us back to Him using exactly what starts in the beginning. He doesn't create something totally new. He's, he's using from Genesis everything that you can find from Revelation. You can go right back to Genesis and you're going to see from the very beginning, from the creation of days, and then man and beast both being created on the sixth day. And because man gave himself over to his appetite, his appetite was to do what? I can be like him. I can be equal to him. Maybe I can take over him. In other words, I can run this show. See, that was, he appealed to his nephesh. He appealed because what did it say? He created man from the dust of the ground. And when he, he said he breathed life into him and he became a living what? A soul. He became a nephesh. He became a being with appetites. He became with passions and desires. We're supposed to be that way. But they are supposed to be under governance of Yahweh and His rules and His ways and His boundaries. And He set boundaries in the garden. And He said, of all the plants and the trees and everything you can eat of, freely, freely eat of it. Tend it. I mean, we're talking fruit coming into bearing every month and all of these things and rivers and all this stuff. But he says, but there's one. That tree is not yours. And the very thing, it, that nephesh, that appetite, that started pulling on him to where they ended up doing what they were not supposed to do. So what is the Father trying to tell us? He's teaching us that we are not going to not have our garden experience. 
We are not going to go through this life with a pass. We're going to have to have that same experience. So you know what? There's going to be one day a year that we are going to have to put that nephesh, that appetite, we're going to have to put that down and we're going to have to concentrate with Him. Because you don't think food got Him in trouble? Food got you in trouble? So why would He not use food through fasting to afflict our soul to bring us back to the most important relationship with Him. Could we not give up an apple fritter one day a week? I mean, one day a year? You know, could you not give up whatever you need, whatever you love, one day in a whole year? He gave up His Son for us. And this is what this is about, and this is why when we bring this, this teaching, and we tie, because we've been trained in patterns and principles all of our life through her dad, and I just know, just believe. And I hear people say that this word fast, and you know, it's, it, it, you know, they tie this word and they tie that word and this word. It don't mean this and it does mean this. It goes back and forth. Guys, fasting is fasting. You know, I'm just not that. I just know that. Well, it's equivalent expressions. And if we don't understand equivalent expressions, then if you, if you, if the scripture uses an idiom and you look up the Hebrew or the Greek word of the idiom used, you're not going to arrive. If you look up humble or you look up afflict, it's not going to say go without food because there's a concept there. The Greek mind, right, wants to go in and, and if you use an idiom, I'm as full as a tick and you go and you look up the word tick, it's not going to tell you that that tick means that you are stuffed to the gills. It's not going to tell you that. You have to know that when a tick has sucked its blood off of you and he's full, he can hold no more. You have to understand that what is the purpose of the saying. So the purpose, the Bible defines what humbling your soul and afflicting your soul looks like to Yahweh Elohim. And the interesting thing too in these Genesis passages, they were tested in the lust of the eye, the lust in the flesh, and the pride of life, right? right? It looked good for food, and they saw they wanted to eat it, and also that they could be like Elohim. When Yeshua came, and the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, took him into the wilderness to be tested by Satan, he was also tested in all three of those areas. The lust After of the flesh, what? After what? For 40 days? After fasting, fasting for 40 days. And he was hungry, right? So he took him to the wilderness for That's 40 right. days and tested him. And so the thing is, he overcame it. And when Yeshua proved that it could be overcome by the enemy, we're to resist the enemy and he will flee, he was showing us that we also can overcome the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. That we too do not have to fall like Adam and Eve. So every time we do this, we're making recompense. Every time we return our tithes for having originally, our forefathers originally robbed in the garden, we are undoing that which was put in place by Adam and Eve. So we're returning and returning and returning back to the garden every time we do it the way he did. So every single thing has a purpose and it's actually undoing that which was set in motion to curse us. Amen. So then it says this, because of one man's sin, well, I was reading it. There you go. All, all fall, I guess. But because of one man's death, many came to repentance. Um, first, present tense. Sounds good to me. So what is Yom Kippur? The National Day of Repentance, Judgment Day. That which we go through to determine if we go to the marriage supper of the Lamb or Sukkot. Do you think it's interesting the Bible calls it the marriage supper of the Lamb? That's redemption language. That's saying that you ate something to get you kicked out, but I've prepared a supper for you that you're going to get to eat with me. You thought eating from that tree in the midst of the garden was eating with me and would make you like me and closer to me. That actually cut you off. Now, if you'll do what I tell you to do right before Sukkot, he called it a supper. 
You think that's a coincidence? So we will definitely get to eat from the tree of life instead of eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So being able to partake of the tree of life and to be able to eat, and that's what we all want to eat of, and that's that supper. This is what we're going to all get to partake of. And this is going to be the beautiful thing. But yet for us, every year, this is what this speaks of. It speaks of exactly the judgment, what happened, that what Adam did in the garden, and what Yeshua did at Pesach. All of it. Remember we talked about... Um, being sealed, even at, at Shavuot, being sealed there when He gave the Torah and He gave the Spirit, this sealing. We need to hold on to that sealing and walk in that sealing to bring us to this point. And so what He's doing is, is He's also in this feast and festivals, He's reminding us of what it still cost. Because Yeshua is the high priest. He's still there. And this is what's beautiful ab about this story. It talks about these two goats. We're not going to talk about, you know, you got one goat that was laid hands on and he was put out and the other goat was sacrificed. It wasn't a very good end for either goat, really. But you can see that Yeshua paid that price on both sides. But yet we get to partake. And this is what she's saying here. If we do what we need to do to not get ourselves cut off, we can celebrate a feast and a festival with Him in the kingdom, not only just for seven days, but for eternity. And that's what this is all about. And here's another little cool connection I find, is that what Adam and Eve did affected all of mankind, right? That's right. Eating from a tree caused the fall of all mankind. Do you think it's another, is it, is it a Yah incident? I think it is, that He requires us as a community, he said what? To have a holy convocation on Yom Kippur. And we're to all do it together in one mind, one accord. So all his people fast and have a holy convocation together on the 10th day of the seventh month. Why? Because it's all mankind that's being brought back, not just two people. So it started with two, it ends with a nation. Now I need that nation to come together and bring it back where we can become one in Him. I mean, I, I just think about this picture. I just would love to see all the world one time, all fast on the Day of Atonement, not arguing about calendars, on the Day of Atonement, all of us, what would it, what would it shake in heaven? If all the nations and everybody, because see, Israel was to follow Yahweh and be a light to who? The nations. All the nations. And then do you know what? By doing this, do you know that all the nations would have followed suit? All the nations would have been celebrating the feast and festivals. All the nations would have been coming up. Because you know why I believe that? Because in Acts 2. Because guess what? The nations were coming to Shavuot. That's right. Because when the Holy Spirit fell and He started, the tongues went out, there was over 70 nations there. And it talked about all of this. So you see that the nations were already coming in off of just of this messed up deal that, that Israel had it all messed up. How much more when Yeshua returns will He straighten out this mess? Because we see in the prophets that Egypt, if you don't come up in the millennium, Egypt, if you don't come up, I will withhold rain from you. So you're going to see the nations. We should have already been doing this. We should have been doing this years ago. We're going to do it in the millennium. But this is why we're here, because this is where we're headed to. Okay, so in Joel... The Scripture says, Consecrate a fast, proclaim a solemn assembly. All right, we know what that is, right? Get it, getting everybody together. Holy convocation, corporate worship. That's what that means. Gathering the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of Yahweh. When did they ever gather everybody to the house of Yahweh, to the temple? Always three times a year when they would always come up to the feast and festivals. So when he's telling them to consecrate a fast and he's telling everybody to come up to the temple of your Elohim and cry out to Yahweh, alas, for the day, for the day of Yahweh is near, 
and it will come as destruction from the Almighty. So we, when we used to read that, right, I know when I was in the charismatic church, we read the book of Joel a lot. We never, not one time, did we connect that to Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement Feast. Never, not once did I hear that. We just proclaimed certain fasts at certain times by our own merits, right, of what we feel like we're supposed to do to accomplish a certain goal, but not one time did we ever fast on the 10th day of the seventh month, we didn't even know there was a, a, a different calendar, really. I mean, you had hints of it, but we didn't really know what calendar it was. And if you're on the wrong calendar and you're proclaiming your own fast, which Isaiah 58 does talk about, then we don't end up at the right time doing the right thing for the right purpose. I'll just give you a small little analogy. This past week, one of our grandchildren had an orthodontist appointment, and they went by a certain clock in the house and when they got to the appointment they wouldn't see them because they missed their appointment by 10 minutes and they would not see th see this grandchild would not there was no the, the door was closed you did not have enough oil you are not coming in and you know what they were shocked but they realized that the clock they went by was on the stove and the stove clock was wrong. It's been losing time, but it was wrong. Had they checked the phone, their phone, they would have known the two were not in sync, but they never, it never even dawned on them that the clock was wrong. That's kind of like we were when, before the Father opened our eyes to his appointed times. We heard a lot of messages about the coming of Yeshua. Uh, I got a cute little meme sent to me uh, last night. I'm gonna paraphrase it, something to this effect. It said, um, I was a very well-behaved person because I was looking for the rapture every 20 seconds. <laughs> and you know why? And that's true in our, in our former walk. And the reason we did is because we didn't understand the feast and festivals of Yahweh. I could have had a lot more relaxed days and unhurried baths if I'd realized that truth, right? Because you're hurrying up, hurrying up, hurrying up. Mm -hmm. So all that to say, we have to be on his time clock, on his calendar, and not only on his time clock and his calendar, but doing it the way he said to do it. So look, when we have these teachers out there and they're diminishing and minimizing the holy convocation, the doing things together, the, uh, the fact that afflicting your soul and humbling your soul does not mean to not fast, and yet there's so much biblical evidence to the contrary. I can tell you this, you're running a great bigger risk not to fast and be told it's better to fast and be told you really didn't have to than to not and say, it was all over my word what humbling the soul meant, we are much safer to, to go ahead and fast. Amen. So all of that to say, when we fast, this is a reverse of the curse. They ate something that got them kicked out and cut off from the garden. If we'll not eat and we will fast, before Sukkot, then we get to enter in to the joy of Yahweh. We get to enter Amen. into Sukkot. Sukkot, the marriage supper of the Lamb, the millennial reign, all of those are equivalent expressions. They mean the same thing in the word. So I find that it's interesting. They ate something and got kicked out. We don't eat something and we're brought back in. It truly is a reverse of the curse. Amen. So if you want to know... So let me say this okay. right here, because this is important too. We always want to make sure, because we're winding down. This is the thing. If, if you're on medication, if you have medical issues or whatever, you have to have water, you have to have fluids, or you have to have whatever you have. That's for you to do. The Father understands that. That's right. Okay? So I'm just saying that I don't want somebody to go out of here and say, well, you know what, bless God, I'm just going to, and then you, you die on me. You know, that ain't what we're doing here. Choose life. You choose life. That's and right. so there's certain people, if people are pregnant, you know, you have to have your water, you have to have whatever. Food. That's right. Now, look, you may want to give up a Ritz cracker. That's fine. A you chocolate know, bar. Or a chocolate bar or whatever. That, I mean, you can, you can do something, you know. 
But at the same time, but what we're saying is, but if you're if you have a medical condition and all that, we're not talking about you doing this. You can pray to the Father and ask Him, but be wise. You know, we have doctors here. You just ask. We want to be, be wise with our bodies too. So I want you to know, is as serious as this is, at the same time, there is grace for there those. is grace for those who are not well. And uh, so I just want you to know that that you take your liberties. You can pray. But There's there may something be some you can, you can fast. If you have a medical condition, there are other things that you can fast, and um, you are very much a part. And, and so do not feel condemnation with that. For Amen. all others that do not have a medical condition, here are six verses, just to name a few. And what this is going to show you is the biblical pattern for fasting was food and water. So for those who are able... That is the most biblical way to fast. For those who are not, choose something or some things that you can do to get uh, a, to be a part of it and know that you are. Amen. So, if we fast on Yom, Yom Kippur, Kippur, we, we will, will feast, feast at, at Sukkot. Sukkot. So, it's just Amen. a beautiful reverse of the curse. Amen. Well, the last thing that I wanted to do was this, is... Wearing a lot of times when we come in here on the first night and we're doing our prayer time on Yom Kippur and we're doing our, you know, the cold Nidre when we're doing our prayers, we wear white. It's customary to wear white. And I'm going to read the scripture why it's customary. Revelation 19, 7 and 9, it says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. See, we're past it. In other words, our blood, yes, of reversing that. Blood going from red to white. It says, It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, white and clean. And he tells you what the fine linen is. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So when we're obedient, and so what we do is, is we like to wear white. Uh, that night is just symbolic of showing us that we have come because when we stand before Him on Judgment Day, if you have the blood of Yeshua that's cleansed you, you will be clothed in white and you will be standing before Him. And I sort of like to represent that. So we just asked if you would do that. That would be, it's really nice to see everybody in white as we're doing our prayers and as we're entering into that time. So do you have anything? All right. Well, I hope and pray, we'll close in prayer, that with this PowerPoint, uh, we do have it. If you need it, Tammy can probably get you some stuff with it. But it is, guys, it's important. And I think we really overemphasize that. So I hope and pray that this was very, very beneficial to us. I know a lot of us has been here for a long time. This is what we do. And uh, but those that are new probably don't really know, well, I'm just doing it because y'all have done it. No, there's a reason why we do what we do. Amen. So Father, we just come to you and I just pray, Father, that you, Yahweh Elohim, deserves all the praises and honor and glory from your people. Also, your son, Yeshua, who paid the price for us to be able to celebrate these feasts and festivals with meaning. So, Father, I just pray that as we're closing this portion out here, that you would be very, Father, it's just so proactive in our lives that you would be mindful to minister to our hearts about this subject matter. And, Father, that it does mean things that we need to take serious when you use the words, and so-and-so is cut off, or those five virgins didn't make it in, and they were beating on the door, and he says, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness, I never had a relationship with you. We need to take all of this serious, because one day this is physically, as well as spiritually, going to happen to us in our life. So Father, I just pray that you would continue to bless us, bless your people, all those who hear uh, through the live streaming and so, Father, we just thank you. We give you honor and glory. In Yeshua's name. Amen and amen. Thank you, guys. All together.
Sound the great shofar for our freedom. Raise the banner to gather our exiles and gather us together from the four corners of the earth. Praised are you, O Yahweh, who gathers in the dispersed of your people, Israel. Amen. Call them in. And prayer for the United States of America altogether. Abba, Father, giver of life, we pray for and entrust the United States of America to your loving care. You are the rock on which this nation was founded. You alone are the true source of life, liberty, and blessings. We cry out for this land to be reclaimed for your glory. May it be that you will dwell among your people. Send your spirit to touch and open the hearts of our nation and its leaders to seek your will and your ways. Grant us the ability and courage to stand for the truth, and may we be that righteous nation you have called us to be. We ask this in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen. And prayer for the peace of Jerusalem, Psalm 122. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of Yahweh. Our feet are standing within your gates, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem that is built as a city that is compact together, to which the tribes go up, even the tribes of Yahweh, an ordinance for Israel, to give thanks to the name of Yahweh, for there thrones were set for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. May peace be within your walls and prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brothers and my friends, I will now say, may peace be within you. For the sake of the house of Yahweh our Elohim, I will seek your good. Berkat HaKohanim, the blessing of the priest. Yevarechecha Adonai Veishmerecha Yair Adonai Panav Elecha Vihuneka Yis Adonai Panav May Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh lift up his favor to you and give you shalom. And it's time for the Kiddush, the blessing over the wine. Baruch Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, Borei pri hagafen. Amen. Blessed are you, O Yahweh our Elohim, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine, and for giving us Yeshua the Messiah, who said, I am the vine, you are the branches. And the blessing over the bread. Baruch Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, hamotzi lechem min haaretz. Amen. Blessed are you, O Yahweh Elohim, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth, and for giving us Yeshua the Messiah, who said, I am the bread of life. It is Shabbat, thank the Lord. It is Shabbat. Thank the Lord, it is your